So, um, yeah, welcome everybody. So, um, to anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Andrew Bickerdike. I'm the, the chair of the trustees here um, at the HTA, um, and I'm here to welcome you this evening and just say a few words um, before we move into the, the formal part of the, the, the meeting. So, um, yeah, as Kath said, we're normally all together for this at our family conference, and um, I know that I, for one, am definitely missing it and missing seeing a lot of old friends um, and, of course, making new ones in in person. Um, but as, as we know, the most important thing this year is that we all are staying safe. So um, so thank you for joining us here uh, online. I say here, I'm in my loft at the moment, but thanks for joining us anyway. And so everyone who's voted um, in advance of today's meeting as well are on the various items. Um, so today's actually my last AGM as the, the chair. So I, I've been fortunate to be a trustee since I think it was the end of 2012 and then the chair of the trustees um, from around the end of 2015. And um, as a lot of you will know, that it's it's something that's deeply personal to, to me. And so I've, I've got to say, it's been the honor of a lifetime to be able to, to be involved. Um, uh, in the last few years we've been through, um, we've established a new strategy for the charity, we've rebranded, we've created new roles to help the organization do what we need to do and to communicate differently. We've been through various financial um, ups and downs. And of course now um, one pandemic um, we've uh, launched our new care home accreditation scheme, we've increased the training of health and care professionals, um, expanded the services that we provide in person, um, and specifically for young people with one of the only, if not the only, face-to-face -face youth engagement service um, uh, of its type in the world. Um, we've provided tens of thousands of face-to-face -face and telephone support sessions, and then um, Increasingly, as I'm sure Kath will speak about, we've, we've worked as part of coalitions of charities to um, start to influence policy, um, as well as working more closely with pharmaceutical companies and helping to fund some of the science communicators um, who are between them all absolutely at the cutting edge of uh, research into potential treatments for Huntington's disease uh, around the world. Um, and of course, now we're, we're closer than ever to um, potential treatments for HD, which we're all desperate for, which we, we need. Um, and the HDA is gearing up now to, to make sure that we do what we can um, to, to make sure that these treatments are available as and when they, they exist. Um, so a year ago, I advised the trustees that my, my trustee colleagues that I was planning to step down at the end of um, my term of office. Um, and what a year it's been since since then. So um, it's been quite a year for charities of all types across the country. Um, and of course, for families with HD, families around the country are now having to also cope with COVID. Um, people with HD are having to shield um, in many cases. Um, uh, and we've had visiting restrictions in care homes. And uh, for the charity end as well, charity fundraising events that we depend on, like the London Marathon, stopped overnight, um, which um, poses quite a challenge for charities like, like ours. Um, and of course, meanwhile, up and down the country, there's a greater need than probably ever for the work that the HDA does. Um, so Kath will speak in a second um, uh, to the detail kind of what the charity's been up to in the, the last year. Um, and, and we'll hear from our treasurer, Nick, um, as well as the financial situation. Um, but I, I am pleased to say that, you know, the, the decisions taken in previous years um, uh, make sure we had adequate levels of reserves for a rainy day or in this case a pandemic um, and thanks to the, the, the genuinely incredible work of the team actually um, and, and your support in the HD community um, we're, we're in probably as good shape as we could hope to be at this particular um, point in time. Um, the, the team at the HDA has been incredible this year and so that includes colleagues who were furloughed at one stage um, as well as those who uh, were with us throughout and had to adapt in their roles so to work differently or to provide more support on the phone or online when we weren't allowed to visit people in their homes. Um, the fundraising team who in particular as well who've ensured that we've been able to keep paying the bills through this um, and, and we'll be able to um, uh, in, in the future. Um, in, in normal times, we receive very little funding from the government. So grants from charitable trusts and um, uh, the support of people like yourselves and uh, donations from individuals are, are really what enables us to do everything that we do. Um, so um, I'll move on and just say that the, the running order for this evening 
Um, we're very shortly going to hear from Kath Stanley, the, the chief executive of the HDA, about the charity's work this year. We'll then move into the formal business meeting, um, and that includes approving last year's minutes, um, hearing from Nick, the treasurer, about um, the finances and formally approving the charity's accounts. Um, we will be appointing our new members of our executive council, our, our trustees, and then we'll formally appoint our auditors. Um, finally, there's, there's an opportunity to ask any questions to us um, and to the trustees. Um, you'll be able to ask those throughout the session um, this evening um, via the chat window on Zoom. Uh, and then they'll actually be collated and asked at, at the end so that we can, we can go through those. So um, with that, I'll hand over to Kath Stanley, the Chief Executive. Kath. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I'll ask Ruth to put up my slides. Thank you, Ruth. Um, Ruth is our technical advisor for the evening. Um, so it's my absolute pleasure to be here this evening and talk about our impact as a charity in, as what Andrew has said, has been one of the most interesting stroke stressful years um, of my time with the HCA. And all of that I'm about to talk about is a collective effort of the absolutely incredible support of our entire staff team. So I think we've always known that we've had a brilliant staff team, whatever department and um, whatever role within the HDA. The one thing that I can say without any shadow of a doubt is that every single person who works for the Huntington's Disease Association have families affected by Huntington's in their hearts. And whatever we do always relates back to that. And our impact is a testimony to the, the team as a whole. So I, I really want to kind of take this opportunity to thank the whole team and um, every single individual staff member. And of course, those families that we support because it is your resilience, it is your stories, it is the things that you say to us that inspire us every day and enable us to come into work and do our job. So thank you to you as families as well. So can I have the next slide, Ruth, please? We, talk, we talked about the slight delay that happens that sends us all into heart failure. So I'm not having heart failure if there's a slight delay. So what we've tried to do is, is kind of look at um, each of our strategic goals and map against that our impact in the last year. So in the last year, our specialist Huntington Disease Advisory Service provided um, information and advice to over 500 people, 520 sorry, 5,258 people affected by Huntington's disease. And out of that had over 1,200 new referrals. So I think that's absolutely incredible when you think about um, the, the kind of size of our organization, that amount of new referrals. Uh, next slide, Ruth. And looking at just a bit, I'm not going to go through these slides, but it is probably as you would expect it to be in terms of the percentages of the people that we supported. Um, next slide, Ruth. And then again, I'm not going to go through these numbers, but I just think it gives you a little bit of a picture of that overall impact that we have as a charity. Um, and these are calls to the advisory service or to our help, telephone helpline um, into our operations team for kind of simple um, solutions to problems. Um, and, and we collate feedback on, on to whether we've actually helped people. And I'm really pleased to say that generally people have felt supported by the, the uh, support that they've received. Next slide, Ruth, please. Um, one of the things we're incredibly proud of, and actually this came about from some of the work that we do, done um, before everybody joined us. Andrew was talking about his kind of touch point with the HDA as a, as a young person. And actually our youth service very much came out of some of those early youth conferences where young people were identifying that they felt quite isolated and alone living in a family with Huntington's. So over the last year, our youth engagement service has worked with over 209 people. And that's between their age ranges of eight to 25. So these are young people living in a family with Huntington's, not with Huntington's disease themselves, um, but actually being able to provide support to them as individuals in that environment is incredibly important. Next slide, Ruth. 
So uh, addressing gaps in support, so um, looking at translation services for people where English isn't their first language and um, developing kind of website and resources so that we, we're very much aware that sometimes um, people may not want to contact our services, they might want to kind of get advice and information anonymously. So developing the resources that we have on our website and, and some of the other things that I'll go on to talk about later have made a real difference to individuals. Um, Heather, I know you asked if we could have copies of the slides afterwards. Certainly you can, if you want to kind of e email into info, if you want copies of the slides, we can arrange for that. Um, next slide, please. So welfare grants, so we have a pot of money set aside to really help out individuals who are struggling with Huntington's disease. And that can be all sorts of things. Um, the remit is that, that they obviously have to have Huntington's disease. Um, and that could be something like a washing machine or increasingly over this period of time through COVID, we've seen an increase in grants to people to buy computers or tablets to mean that they can actually um, access that support in a different way to the way that they have been doing previously. Next slide, Ruth. I think one of the things we're incredibly proud of is our care home accreditation scheme. So this came about um, as a direct result of families saying to us that when it came to a point that people, the people that they were caring for needed to go into long term care, it was incredibly stressful trying to find somewhere where there was an experience and knowledge of Huntington's disease. So our care home accreditation scheme is set up that care homes can apply. They have to meet a series of quite stringent standards. They then have to go undergo a visit from um, an assessor who kind of assesses what they have done. Um, and then if they meet all of those, then they are accredited with a kite mark to say that um, we believe that they deliver a certain standard of uh, uh, care to people with Huntington's. We have two care homes that have started that scheme. We've got another two who are interested. Obviously, COVID has had a massive effect upon care homes, and it's something that we'll be looking to develop um, once the world returns to a bit more of a sane place, if it ever does. Uh, next, thank you. Um, and as Andrew alluded to, we're a very small organisation. Huntington's is a very rare illness, and I'm acutely aware for people on this um, webinar at our AGM that it's not rare to you in, in your particular circumstances and in your family, but in that kind of wider context it is. So working with other organisations means that we have a much louder voice and we can look at areas that cross different um, channels. So the Neurological Alliance, Genetic Alliance UK, Rare Disease UK, the UK Huntington's Disease Network, um, Huntington's Alliance UK and then in the last couple of months it's been really important that we've worked with organisations like National Council for Voluntary Organisations um, because they have a really strong political ear and so being able to campaign with them about making sure that charities weren't forgotten in the whole Covid experience was incredibly important. And also we have a really good relationship with the Department of Work and Pensions, which helps when it comes to uh, families applying for benefits. Next slide, please, Ruth. So our next strategic goal is better knowledge and understanding of Huntington's. We'll have next slide, please. So expanding our training programme in 2019-20 was really important. We refreshed all of our training materials to make them more visual and more engaging. And then we've created some tailored made training for specific health groups um, and just, uh, specific sectors to make it more relevant to them. Next slide, Ruth. And I'm pleased to say this gives you some indication of, of the amount of work that's done, but also the, the, the value to people um, for those training sessions. Ultimately, we can't be everywhere. So actually ensuring that health and social care professionals have a better understanding of Huntington's is ultimately the way we can make a difference to improving quality of care for individuals with Huntington's and their families. Next slide, Ruth. We've also launched some new guides and we've got um, some more coming along the way. Um, 
on, on a series of different topics. And those topics were topics that were identified from, from families that were the most important to them. We have a twice yearly me member magazine and newsletter. And I think um, it's quite incredible that the information has been downloaded from our website over 9,000 times, which I think is amazing. Um, next slide, Ruth. So talking about our website, again, more and more people are moving towards kind of digital to a way of, of uh, access and support, certainly in the earlier stages of the illness. So developing that, making sure the resources or information were there and easy to find, having kind of blogs from individuals, both about living with Huntington's, that lived experience, and also kind of um, some professional blogs. And 158,000 people visited our site, which I think is uh, that kind of blows my mind a little bit, I'll be honest. Um, next slide, Ruth, please. And then educating decision makers. We know that there are some real challenges for people affected by Huntington's disease out there. So we've been working with the Association of British Insurers and the British Insurers Brokers Association to help make sure it's more accessible. And then we've been um, of a big campaign through 2018-19 was um, challenging the armed forces on their outdated recruitment practices. And I would like to say that we've had great success in that, but I'm very disappointed to say we've had very limited success with that. Um, and that's certainly not through want of trying, but we have engaged with them and we have put them in contact with those people, those clinicians and researchers who are working in the field of Huntington's to, to enable their um, clinicians and researchers to have a better understanding of, of how their decision-making is perhaps out of date. Um, next slide, please, Ruth. So our next strategic goal is greater opportunity for peer support and community involvement. And we'll have the next slide, yeah. So in-person um, peer support, so through national events, such as things like this normally, um, our Young Adults Conference, our Juvenile Weekend, our Volunteer Award Ceremony, and obviously all of those things this year have been very different. Um, lo local events that have happened and branches and support groups remain absolutely crucial to us as an organisation, that, that kind of peer support that is given by those people who either lived or are living with Huntington's disease. And next slide, Ruth. We also looked at kind of branches and support groups and undergone a review. We realised that they're really important. We also realised that perhaps we haven't supported branches and support groups as well as we could have done. And so the focus group have been working on how we can improve that, what information we need, some kind of process and paperwork that's needed, and then offering a new design web page for each branch and support group so that they can make that local information event, which is crucially important more accessible. Next slide, Ruth. Online peer support, as I've alluded to a few times, is something that's kind of grown and grown and grown, and certainly through the pandemic has grown unsubstantially. Um, I would, well, I'm just going to say unprecedentedly, but I hate that term because it's so overused in the world at the moment. But kind of looking at our message board, um, Facebook and Twitter have become an, another way of, of providing support to people sharing people's stories on social media so that people don't feel so alone, they can see that other people are living that very similar experience to them. And then presenting opportunities for the Huntington's community to connect and interact. Um, next slide, Ruth. So our patient and public um, involvement group is something that we're really proud of. And I have to thank Ruth for being the kind of spearhead on this and, and Steve, one of our trustees who I know is, is kind of here working um, really hard. And basically this is all people who maybe have Huntington's, are at risk to Huntington's, have been carers for people with Huntington's, are carers for people with Huntington's, who can really look at what we are doing as an organisation and say, yes, that is your, what the right direction, or yes, that information is useful to people, or no, it really isn't. And increasingly, it's used from external consultations from researchers who are looking at research projects um, and kind of research documents and things. And it's incredibly important for our, to give people with Huntington's community a voice on key matters. Um, next slide, Ruth. 
So our next goal is improved understanding of Huntington's disease and our charity within the general public. I know this is an area of great frustration for families that, you know, there's a very um, reduced lack of understanding of Huntington's disease. So it's something that we work really hard to try and raise the profile of. So next slide, Ruth, please. So this is um, obviously 2019 Awareness Week um, where we had kind of lots of involvement of, of buildings lighting up and people sharing their stories and running in, in information events specifically for carers. Next slide, Ruth. And then working with the media, um, which is really quite difficult to kind of, unless you've got massive budget to do. So this year we've, we've done really quite well in working with some journalists, radios and um, some novelists um, I go through periods where reading scripts for casualty seems to be my permanent job, but just making sure that information that kind of goes out there on these soaps, yes, it's a drama, but, you know, it's incredibly important that the information about Huntington's is accurate because people see that and that's real life to them. And then appearing on things like the Victoria Derbyshire show, I wasn't responsible for it shutting down, I promise you. Um, but, you know, just kind of raising that profile. And then there was a premiere of the movie that we showed last year. I think it was last year at our family conference uh, of the Dancing of the Vatican. Um, next slide, please. And then a stronger champion to, sorry, stronger charity to better champion the needs of the community. So unless we, as a charity, are strong, we can't um, represent the community that we support. Uh, next slide, Ruth. So how have we done that? Well, first of all, we can't get away from um, talking about the pandemic. I'm sorry, it'd be nice to get away from it for an evening, but we really can't. And literally overnight, we had to change the way that we worked on so many levels. So converting to remote support by email, by Zoom, by telephone, moving kind of meetings online, developing virtual training sessions, um, developing webinars, which we first trialed, but actually since the pandemic have delivered over 15 with over 255 people and actually I tailoring those to those people to those topics that were relevant at the time so when kind of COVID and the first lockdown came one of the things that really was apparent was that carers were struggling with individuals with Huntington's not understanding lack of awareness of the impact of of, of why they had to stay locked down so making sure the webinars that we put on were really practical and helpful information. And I have to say a big shout out to Ruth here, who's been absolutely spearheaded in both identifying speakers, but also making sure that we have this constant run of webinars that are relevant to people. And then our, sorry, Ruth, just back one. <laughs> then our um, office team. So we, we are fundraising and operations team were um, based in, in our central office. Um, with no kind of resources, which is in a shared building, which adds its own complication. We've kind of no real resources to get people working from home. And within 48 hours, we basically moved people from working from the office to working from home with everything that was needed. So when somebody rang our main number, they didn't have any difference in the service that they provided. Um, and I would like to say a big th thank you to Anna in particular, for this because that was her working tirelessly um, over for 23 hours out of a 24 hour day to make that seamless. And one of the positives, if if I can say, of, of adapting to the pandemic is that it has made us much more um, digitally focused in terms of our process and moving away from kind of paper-based focuses, which can only be a, a, a positive thing. Um, next slide, please. So other things that we've done to strengthen the charity, putting together clear strategies, having our business continuity plan, and, and obviously working on that to build in kind of information around the pandemic, making sure that we have that consistent charity branding, which might sound like it's not particularly important. But if you think of those big charities like Macmillan or NSPCC, as soon as you start to think about those, you have a picture in your head as to what that looks like. And that's what we need to aim towards with Huntington's Disease Association. So when we say that word, people have an image of what we are and who we are. 
um, expanding our range of merchandising, merchandise, looking at kind of different working models, um, staff training, making sure safeguarding stuff was up to date, developing and maintaining databases and data security, which was incredibly important. And we had to put some steps in place when we were having people kind of moving from working from an office space to home. And then regular executive council meetings for effective governance, which from a personal note during this pandemic, which has we've had to think on our feet on an hourly basis, having that support from our board of trustees has been absolutely invaluable. Um, next slide, please. So then um, supporting Huntington's research is, is another of our goals. Um, and we have funded kind of three projects over uh, the period of time. And this, we're in the final year of fundings for these projects now. Um, next slide, please. And then we, know, we are all aware, acutely aware that we are in a very exciting time in terms of Huntington's research. But there's also lots of information and misinformation out there. So making sure that we have the correct information on our website, that we're able to um, communicate what is happening in ways that people can understand, um, that people are able to be involved in research, um, and that actually the researchers have a grounding as to how Huntington's affects individuals, which is where HD Voice comes in. Um, next slide, please. And then looking at working together in different ways. So again, Andrew alluded to this, but we've never really had um, opportunity to work with some of the big pharma companies or with NICE or with some other organizations because those um, treatments or prospective treatments have just not been there. So over the last kind of 12, 18 months, several different things have come up. So one of the key influences in terms of if and when any prospective treatment comes to market and is licensed um, is to make sure that that is affordable and that it is funded through the NHS. So several of the different um, pharmaceutical companies are working on projects around this and we are involved in all of those. But equally, there is a company called Tesella, who um, one of their senior managers has a family connection to Huntington's and they are doing some unique work with us as a charity. So we have some independent information, which ultimately when it comes to putting a submission into NICE to ensure that any drug is available on the NHS will be crucial. So they're, they're incredibly big pieces of work, but incredibly important pieces of work. And then working with other charities across the UK and Europe, um, sharing information, sharing resources, and then developing those links with pharmaceutical companies so that we know that what, what is happening and that we have some influence and, and um, say in how they are approaching things. Uh, next slide, please. So looking ahead, and I think sometimes at the moment, it's quite hard to, to, to look ahead, but you know, it's really important that we do that. You, we do that. Um, so looking at technology to provide more support and education and to ensure safe interaction, expanding our webinar and online training programs, um, website, social media, and e-newsletter develop, development so that we can reach, reach as many people as possible. Um, developing our uh, care home accreditation, um, developing our volunteer network, continuing to raise awareness, you know, adapting our services and fundraising to a pandemic and, and Brexit, which seems to have been a forgotten world, word in the whole kind of pandemic crisis, but, you know, come January is going to have an impact on, on all of us. And then kind of working in partnership to improve care support and access to future treatments. Um, next slide, Ruth, please. So I have two um, leaving pleas for you, and I make no apologies for this, but um, one is that if you have not completed our keeping in touch uh, information on our website, I would ask you to go and do that. So you'll be aware under data protection regulation, we are limited in terms of um, how we can communicate with people. 
who are um, either not members or even if they are members, if we don't have email addresses for those members. So please, if you leave this meeting today and could go onto our website and, and complete that keeping in touch, that would be really great because it means that you'll get to hear more about all of these fantastic things that we're doing. And then the other is something that is incredibly exciting. So Marshall's Garden uh, are um, a big horticultural organization and have chosen us to work with us to develop an amaryllis, which is called the Hercules amaryllis, and they're selling it through their, their online services. Um, it's beauty, it, it's matched to our logo colors. Um, and it's the first time really that we've had the opportunity to do something like that. Each of these boxes that go out have information about Huntington's disease and the work that we do. So really great opportunity to kind of um, raise the profile of the organization about our work and about Huntington's disease in people who've never heard about it before, but it will only work if we buy it. So if you haven't done your Christmas shopping yet, um, again, go onto our website and please order as many amaryllises as you possibly can. And everybody in my family is having an amaryllis for Christmas, even if they don't like them. Um, and I think that's it for me. So thank you very much. Um, as I said before, thank you to the team who've worked incredibly hard. Um, and that's me done. Thank you. Thank you, Kath. Um, so, I mean, you'll, you'll see there's a staggering amount of work has gone on from the whole team, as Kath said, during the course of this year. Um, so just yeah, to reiterate, thank you to every single person um, who's made it all happen. Um, so um, don't forget, if you want to ask questions, you, you can. You can enter them in the chat window, the, the Q&A, sorry, the chat window here, um, and then we'll collate them and we can ask them at, at, at the end, um, or we can address them as we go through if they're sort of particularly uh, uh, easy um, to, to ask. Um, so uh, we'll move into the formal part of our um, agenda for the evening. So this is the, um, the actual annual general meeting that every charity has to have um, each, each year. Um, and so there's various sort of set pieces that everybody has, every charity has to go through. Um, so um, uh, the first of which is to adopt the, the minutes of the last AGM. So um, these have all been made available on the uh, HGA's website. Um, and uh, they do, to me, look like a very good uh, record of, um, of the meeting. Um, now, uh, so I propose that these are um, adopted, and I believe, Nick, that you're going to second that. Yeah. Yes, I was going um, to second those. I, uh, the, the, I like the, my, the minutes of my finance section are fine, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so um, what we, um, so we don't actually uh, formally need to vote on those. Um, so, um, uh, so that motion is passed. Uh, Kath, correct me if that's wrong, of course. Um, so um, moving forward then through the other formalities um, uh, that we need to go through, the, the next one, and the, the largest section of this really is our treasurer's report. So um, I'll hand over to uh, Nick Heath, our treasurer. Nick. Right. Thank you very much, Andrew. I, I must say it's a bit weird speaking into nothing and not having any interaction with the people on the other side. So um, bear with me if I'm more rambling than usual. But um, Ruth, have you got the, the first um, slide there? Um, the accounts are available on our website and they have been fully audited and signed off by the auditors. And if you look at the um, income and expenditure account, hopefully you can see the numbers on there. And you can see that the income um, was slightly down on the year at 1,681,000, which was actually due to uh, just uh, most of the income streams were virtually level, but the amount of legacies we were notified of during the year was slightly down. So that's, that's just the basic underlying situation. Um, the, <laughs> What's going to happen in the in the coming year? I, I will come on to later on as to where we are in the balance of everything. Um, but can we now move down the page a little bit? Um, oh, that, that's it. Thank you. Yes. So, you, on the expenditure side, um, our activities once again were broadly in line with last year. Um, 
in particular, um, the expenditure was very close to our budget. We have quite a rigorous budget um, uh, set up so that um, it's uh, a draft one is prepared, then it goes to all the individual um, budget holders within the organization. And then it comes back um, after various discussions about who's going to spend what, and then it gets approved by the trustees. And I'm very pleased that all the spenders have managed to keep within their budgets and they don't come to me asking for more. They've pretty been an excellent team. Um, this, the budget also goes through the finance committee, which has been much more active this year. And I would like to thank those who've been involved with the, with the thing because it's, it's quite important. And I think it does give back up to the trustees and, and to Kath as to making sure that we are particularly reviewing our income and expenditure all the time, especially under these current conditions. So I, I want to thank those people who have helped me with that um, and getting us into a, a position where I've got, I've got a little team helping me as the treasurer um, to, to assess what's going on and, and, and sort of then feeding that into the trustees. So I think that's been an, an excellent development this year uh, to making the whole thing more active. Um, if we could go down the, the, the you can see that the overall surplus was 61,000 this year. I'm sorry, I've whipped past that. There's 61,000 in the year to 31st March 2020. Um, that's after taking account of uh, a 30 odd thousand uh, uh, writing down of our investments, because obviously the, the 31st of March, when our investments are valued, as you can see, the the investment value there is 374,000 as at 31st of March, which was about 40,000 off what it had been before the stock market collapsed. And I'm pleased to report that that's now back up to um, the, the, three, the 410, 415,000, which is the investments, which gives us something to fall back on if things really get difficult going forward. Um, Going a bit further down, you can see we got cash and bank in hand of at the year end of 579,000. Um, that's money which is held by the centre um, in the NatWest Bank account and the CCLA, which is the charity investment funds, and also the money that's held in the branches. Um, so overall, the, the, the balance sheet, as you can see, shows an improvement from 1,027,000 to 1,089,000. And going a bit further down, you can see that the unrestricted funds, which are funds which we're, we've got available and which we consider to be our reserves, which we can actually um, rely on in, in difficult times, which is of 750,000. We've also got the designated funds, which are for future projects. And we're obviously considering that now and how they may well be required going forward with um, possible developments of treatments and us needing to invest and spend money on supporting the whole implementation of, of, of making uh, active, um, systems to, to deliver anything and our involvement in that. So that's something we are considering going forward, but we keep that money designated for that and it keeps our reserves looking not too excessive. In fact, the 750 is approximately six months of, of running expenses, which is what the Charity Commission recommend that we should have. There's no requirement to have it, but it's been a target of ours for a while to get the reserves back up to that level after we've had one or two years when we had deficits. So that um, is a fairly positive situation to say that at, as at the 31st of March, we got ourselves into a situation where we had adequate reserves to cope with anything that might come along. Well, obviously something has come along and it, it has had a very interesting effect on our accounts in, an, in that initially we were concerned that income would drop off a cliff immediately and we'd be in, in severe um, difficulties. In fact, what's happened, <coughs> excuse me, is that the, the funds have continued to come in 
from community activities for a while after the beginning of the pandemic, money continued to flow in. And it's only now that community activities income has really dropped off. But in place of that, we have received over 80,000 um, grant from the government's charity support program to get everybody back to work. And uh, over 90,000 from the Rousing Foundation also for similar purposes. So in fact, um, we, we've, we've been able to maintain our reserves and obviously we've had the money for the furlough support from the government, which has enabled us to carry on paying all the staff who were furloughed at their full um, pay. So it, it, we have, by careful management, basically got ourselves into a position at the start where we were able to cover the, cover the problems which we are now seeing. Now, at the moment, obviously the community funding is falling off and those one-off grants will fall off. And I anticipate that we will get through about a quarter of a million of that cash before the 31st of March. Um, but we have the cash now. We have, we have, because of all these extra bits of money coming in and the community fundraising continuing uh, for much longer than we thought, I would anticipate that the year for up to 21, to 31st of March 21, will be a break-even situation. Um, and that's uh, after accounting for this 200, a quarter of a million, I expect to, to the, the cash outflow in the next, up to the 31st of March. Um, what is obviously going to be difficult, because we won't, we, we've had some very generous one-off individual donations as well, which has boosted the situation. So we are, as, as at the 31st of March 21, I think we will be in a very good position to um, sustain our support for everything that the association does. And I know uh, it, we may well end up having a further deficit in 21, 22, because we just don't know what's going to happen. But I think we should have enough money to, to carry on our work as, as in a very, well, obviously a developing way, but a level of support to, to the community which uh, everybody and members would want. So I have confidence that we can go forward into um, 2021, which is our 50th year, and actually um, carry on delivering the services through the charity that we all want. So that's my summary. I don't know whether... Um, We've got any uh, questions which have popped up, Ruth, in the in the um, while I've been waffling on. But if if people have anything else to ask me, um, obviously it may not come to mind at the moment. But when you've had a chance to look at the accounts, do um, send any questions you might have uh, through to me. Um, Ruth, yeah, I can't say anything. Sorry, Ruth. I was just going to say I can't say. Anything particularly relating to finance but I did want to just take that opportunity to say um, as Nick has alluded to um, our fundraising team have done just the most incredible job in in incredibly difficult circumstances so I think at the beginning of the pandemic we were all a bit like yes. goodness me what's going to happen and te absolute testimony to our fundraising team but to Joe and to Paul in particular for really working their socks off to to make sure that these big grants that we've had in and we've had in and also um in terms of you alluded to it's our anniversary year next year and joe's been doing a lot of work around uh making sure that that's really a, a year that we can celebrate so i know that we'll be very excited about sharing those some of those ideas moving forward but huge thank you paul and joe Yes, absolutely, because they've, they've maintained the level of income and actually boosted the level of income in some areas, which I was just so worried that we wouldn't get that income in. And they've been able to maintain our, our profile with some of these charities, like the rousing people who don't give money normally to charities other than those which they, they have some family or personal involvement through. And actually, to for our team to get their application in in a standard and level which 
is resulting in us getting 95,000. In fact, they sent us 105 because they sent 10,000 too much. We had to send the 10,000 back. But anyway, I thought perhaps we ought to rather than just hanging on to it. Um, but the, the, those sort of things have been tremendous initiatives of the fundraising team who have worked um, without, their, their resources are limited. I, 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 uh, I, uh, those of the people who've been trustees will know, I, I'm very keen that we, we must maintain and be careful with our resources. Um, and, but, and, and they have done tremendous job with what is a, a, a resource allocation which is way less than most people most charities of our size um, actually have so uh, I do echo Castle I'm sorry I should have said something a bit more about that perhaps in my waffling now have we got a question I saw something flash up but perhaps that's something else no right no, no questions no there was an uh, there was an observation from Bridget I think You've already talked about about how the the Julia and Hans Rousling Foundation was unbelievably competitive, which it it really was. So um, yeah, it was incredible work by Joe and Paul and the, the fundraising team. Right. So we haven't had any any more questions. So I would propose that the accounts be accepted. Um, I, I think we've had um, presumably we've had uh, hopefully we've had some voting on this before the meeting. Yeah, yeah, so indeed. all members have had the opportunity to vote prior to the meeting, um, and so it is. We're, we're just confirming that there is a majority vote, Andrew, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we've had. Um, yeah. So the majority of votes we've already had confirm that um, we're able to uh, um, adopt the accounts. Um, so those are. So those are carried. Excellent. Right. Well, that's that was always it's always a thing. We the actually accounts are signed off. So the. The, the AGM can either accept or reject them. If they reject them, then that is a bit of a problem. But um, anyway, they've already been signed off and they are um, now available um, through our website and they will be up at the, at, um, at the Charity Commission in, in very, very shortly and, and the auditors will send a copy to Companies House. So they're all those places where they are, are accessible for people to see. Great. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, and as, as Nick said, um, if there are any other questions that, you, that, that pop up sort of during this, we can always take those at the end as, as well. Um, so um, we'll move on to the, the next part of the formal business meeting, which is the election of the Executive Council. So um, the Executive Council are the, the trustees of the HDA. So um, uh, it's a, a voluntary position that people take on and their, their role is um, to oversee the work of the HDA and to steer that um, on behalf of all of you, the, the members. Um, and they're accountable, of course, to, to you as members, but also to the Charity Commission and the fundraising regulator for everything the charity does. Um, so the, the trustees join for a, a three year um, term of office and um, uh, after that they can either stand again or they, they, they can stand down. Um, so um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, I'm standing down at this, um, uh, this year um, as my term's coming to an end. Um, and there is a process in place uh, now amongst the trustees to um, um, appoint uh, a new chair um, from amongst them. Um, so for today, um, I can confirm that um, three of the existing trustees um, are standing for re-election um, as their terms of office have come to end, and that's Sean Barker, Kathy Lyon and Matt Ellison. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted that all three of them are standing again, I must say. Um, uh, also, we've got two new trustees standing, and those are Bridget Waters, who's a, a fundraising consultant and um, has got extensive experience in the charity sector, and, and Noinia Lahini, who's a, a clinical geneticist um, with a, a lot of experience over many years of working with people um, with Huntington's and um, quite extensive networks in the HD community here in the UK and, um, uh, and uh, across Europe. So um, I can confirm that um, as with the accounts, all of our voting members have been given the opportunity to vote prior to the meeting. Um, 
and then um, uh, having collated the votes, we can confirm that a majority um, have voted in favour of accepting all of the people I just mentioned as trustees of the HDA. So, um, so uh, they are all appointed, and that 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 resolution is is carried. Uh, congratulations, Louis. Um, and the final part of the formal business meeting then is for us to appoint our auditors. Um, so. Um, I propose a resolution that we appoint DSG chartered accountants um, as our auditors. And I believe, uh, Mr. Treasurer, that you, you're going to second that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Great. Um, and again, as with the Executive Council and the accounts, voting members have had the opportunity to vote prior to this meeting. Um, and the majority have been in favour of um, appointing DSG. So, um, so that resolution is also formally um, carried and that they are, are, um, are nominated um, auditors. So um, are there any other questions at this point? Let me have a look. No. Nope. Okay. Um, so that's in that case concludes the, the, the formal part of the business meeting. Um, so I guess if it's all right, I'll just say something on a personal note for, for, for me, which is, um, as I said at the beginning, it really has been the honour of my lifetime, I think, to be involved in the HDA. And um, sorry, <laughs> and uh, although I'm stepping down today, I think you, um, you all know that I'll continue to fundraise and to keep in touch. Um, because as um, a lot of you who are dialed in know, this is something that's really personal to me and to, to my family. So um, I, ju I just want to say, a, a really genuine thank you to all of the staff at the HDA. I know we've said that a couple of times through this, but um, they really do go above and beyond what you would expect from someone in their work. Um, it's more than a job to everybody that works at the HDA. Um, every single one of the specialist advisors, um, to, to Bill and Ruth who lead that team, um, Joe and Paul in our fundraising team and colleagues, um, Safi, who helps us communicate to, to all of you and the, the wider public. Um, Anna, um, who um, started as Cath's PA and now behind the scenes runs a huge amount of what the HDA does and makes the place work. Um, um, it's, it's quite incredible, really. Um, I do want to thank all of the trustees as well. So um, I know normally we're set up at the front um, on the stage for this bit, um, but uh, they're all dialed in. Um, and um, so I do want to thank all of you. Um, uh, for the trustees, you know, they could spend their free time doing other things, but all of them choose to spend their evenings and weekends um, thinking about the work of the HDA and talking to me and Nick and Kath about money, services, planning, science um, and everything else that we have to think about. Um, I've got to properly thank Kath as well. Um, Kath has known me since long before I was involved in the HDA formally and um, I think as you would have seen through the presentation this evening, Kath works incredibly hard for families with HD every single day and um, again as I've said with other people in the team it's clearly more than a job to to you, Kath, uh, to, to, um, to, to everybody, really. So, um, and lastly, I think I'll just say thanks to everybody else that's dialed in. Um, the, the, the charity exists for all of you, um, and it's a success thanks to you and your support, your stories, the inspiration that Kath and everybody here gets from that, um, your fundraising, your volunteering. Um, and I, I've got to say, I'm just hugely grateful to, um, to be part of this community. So, um, thank you all very much for joining the meeting this evening. Thank you, Kath, Nick, for speaking and to Ruth for working the technology behind the scenes. Thank you very much. Right, well... Just going to hand over to Nick now. Oh, yes. Be be before we all go, on behalf of the trustees and obviously and the members, I, I, I just want to say a few words of, of thanks to Andrew, which I think I'm sure we were all um, want to do. and We would all do if we were all sitting round or in, in uh, Telford or Birmingham or wherever we are um, to actually do, but we can't do that. And so I just thought I, perhaps I should say a few words being the only other person on the picture, but um, Andrew's first meeting as the chair was the 5th of December, 2015. And it was following his formal election to the, um, the post and also taking over from Heather Thomas was uh, certainly um, an extremely hard act to follow in, 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 in the association and being 
that head, which ha the, the, the chair has to take that sort of role. Um, and Andrew brought his immense experience of the charity sector, um, and in particular, his, appli appli his application of admin and organizational experience um, to us, which has been invaluable over the last five years. And I mean, I can't believe it's five years since Andrew took over and Heather wasn't the chair. It just doesn't seem like possibly that length of time. It probably seems much longer to you, Andrew, but I think um, he doesn't. To, 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 to us, it doesn't. And um, he, the whole HDA has, as you've heard, developed, and we all know it has to continue to develop in so many ways over these five years. Um, also, we've we've had obviously we have difficult decisions to make from time to time, and they have to be taken. Um, and the chair has to ensure that all the options that are available at the time are evaluated and properly discussed. And he's got to ensure that obviously the objects of the association and the requirements of the charity commission and all the wishes of the members are taken into account, which is, is a difficult balancing act because you've got so many pressures coming in from different angles. And obviously there's the, 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 the staff and all those all other things which naturally come to fall into the lap of the person who's the head of the, this, the organization. Um, and Andrew brought a calmness and a clarity of thought to all this, which I, I think all the trustees and hopefully the members will appreciate. And so I would really thank you, Andrew, for all your work on the executive and as chair over the last uh, executive for many for years and the chair of the last five years, which has put the association in, in a place where it, it can actually deal with the future challenges. And we, we have been put into that position because of the organization, because of all the thoughts, the away days, everything that you contributed and brought into the operation. So on behalf of the members and the trustees, thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Um, I don't know what to say to that. Thank you very much. I, I really yeah. appreciate it. As I say, it's been the honour of a lifetime. So um, I'm very grateful for all yes. of your And, and I, I do hope we can put this uh, a tribute into one of the magazines. It's tribute, it sounds a bit, but, but something so that, so that other members can, can actually appreciate what you've done and so yeah. that they can read that and see it. We're on it. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good. Right. Unless there's any more surprises, I believe that's the, <laughs> the end of the meeting. <laughs> thank you all very much right. for dialing in. Um, and uh, thank you, Kath and Nick, for everything. Um, yeah, thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.